Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. I'm thrilled to be with you live, and I'm thrilled our guest is here. As you know, I founded the Sales Pro Network to elevate the profession of sales and to give salespeople a place where they can come and ask questions, get great advice and coaching, uh, and increase your income. As you know, every Friday, usually at 10 a.m. Eastern time, we either do a live broadcast with somebody who can add value to the profession of sales or I do a live training. I know it's been a little confusing lately. I thought we were doing a training today. It turned out I completely forgot that I had booked this fantastic guest for you. Thank goodness she remembered. And uh, here we are today. So it's my pleasure to now introduce you, and I believe I'm pronouncing your name correctly, to Shweta Shayamani. Did I pronounce that correctly, Shweta? Shweta. 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 So close. Okay. That's three for three this morning. Let's hope we can do a great broadcast. Welcome to the Sales Pro Network. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right, let's get right into the questions. For, well, first, would you just describe to people uh, what you do and maybe give us maybe the two-minute background on what brought you to this point? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually am an energy medicine practitioner, holistic healer, and a transformational coach. And this might seem a little unusual for me to be a guest on a sales pro network program because I don't only work with salespeople. I work with some people who are in sales, but that is not my primary function. And um, so I started out in corporate, working for a Fortune 500 financial firm, um, was doing really, really well, had my eyes set on the C-suite. Um, on, on my journey up to the C-suite, I really discovered that it was not for me. I, everybody thought I had the perfect job and it was the perfect job, but it wasn't my perfect job. So I leapt off the corporate ladder and became an entrepreneur, did a few different things. And while those other ventures were going on, my mother was having some serious health issues and she had been having health issues for most of my life. And we needed to look for alternatives for her because, you know, traditional medicine did not have answers for her. And so in that discovery process, I discovered what it is that's my soul's purpose. And that is to really help people empower themselves by restoring balance to mind and body. And so now that's the work that I do. And the mindset work that I do with clients is really what I wanted to offer to you and your audience today, because I understand that obviously with sales, mindset is just such a key component for success. And I have a very different view of mindset than most people. So I thought it would be really cool to be able to share that with all of you. We're definitely going to get to mindset. Absolutely. A hundred percent. By the way, if you're watching us live, please say hello in the comments. If you have not connected your Facebook to StreamYard, then please put your name in the comments. Otherwise, we won't know who you are. And if you're watching this on the replay later on, please put replay in the comments. So from your email signature, uh, there were two things that immediately stood out to me. What are rapid transformational therapy and what is bi bioenergetics? So rapid transformational therapy is a protocol that's based on hypnotherapy. It actually allows us to access the subconscious content in our mind to understand why we behave or don't behave in certain ways. So it really is something that allows us to go deep into mindset and our consciousness to discover where the origin story of certain dysfunctional patterns began. So if we're having issues with confidence, if we're having issues with fear or anxiety, we can really uproot what those, where those things started and then change the psychology that's underneath so that we can start to behave in a way that's more consistent with what we want. So that's what rapid transformational therapy is. It is a phenomenal modality. I've seen it help people in situations where years and years and years of therapy and traditional psychotherapy has not helped. Because one of the limitations with psychotherapy, and believe me, I've been in therapy myself before, is that we can only talk about the things that we're conscious about, right? So if there's something in the subconscious just by definition, we can't access it. And our beliefs live in the subconscious. Out of the 40 to 60,000 thoughts a day that we have, 90 to 98% of them are subconscious. So the subconscious is extraordinarily powerful. In um, the book of life and how to play it, written by Florence Scovel Shin in the 1920s, she called the subconscious mind as undirected power. And that is totally what it is. So when we can access that subconscious and start directing it toward creating what we want, I mean, there's no limit. So that's our rapid transformational therapy. And bioenergetics is working with our energy body. And this is um, based in quantum physics, whereas traditional medicine is based in Newtonian physics. So it's just two different bodies of science in which this work 
is based. And bioenergetics is working with the subtle energy body that's talked about in yogic traditions. It's talked about in Chinese medicine. So as people may be familiar with the meridian system of Chinese medicine or the chakra system or the auric body of the yogic tradition. So doing bioenergetics is working with the life energy that thing that animates us. And so we use different points on the body. I'm gonna show some of them to you and your audience today that we can do to um, self-regulate our nervous system. And the reason I love the bioenergetic work is because the electromagnetic system and the nervous system are the two first systems to develop in a fetus. And so they are very, very closely connected. And when you think about it, the nervous system is electrochemical. There's electrical signals that go through our nervous system. And what does the nervous system regulate in our body? Everything, right? So when we work with the electromagnetic system and the bioenergetics, we're affecting the nervous system. And that's why it works so well. And so that's what that is. So would Reiki be a form of bioenergetics? Reiki is a form of energy work. Um, I don't practice Reiki. Um, I'm not sure if with Reiki, there's points on the body that you touch. Have you ever had a Reiki session? Can you speak to that many and she never touched me she she's okay. covering over my body yeah so she is working with a bioenergetic field because the, the auric field actually extends well beyond the physical construct of our body it can go as far as 20 feet out and if people are doing a presentation and stuff you want to actually extend your bioenergetic field out because you want to establish presence and people who have that charisma or presence whatever you want to call it they have a very solid, sturdy bioenergetic field. I mean, it's always in motion, but when they're speaking or when they're addressing a group, their aura is probably, it is, not probably, it is very strong, pushed out and established. Wow. So, and uh, one more thing about rapid transformational therapy. T traditional uh, therapy takes a very long time. Am I correct in assuming that the very word rapid in the beginning means you can make quick changes? Yes, very, very quick changes. Um, I've seen people create changes in their life in one rapid transformational therapy session, which the process goes over a month. So I don't want to mislead anybody and say one afternoon and it's over. There's, there's a process that happens over the course of a month. But I have seen people transform decades long issues in one you know, chunk in about a month um, because you can just go deep. So yeah, it's quick, quick, quick. Very cool. I'll just remind you guys, if you have not connected your Facebook account to StreamYard, when you leave a comment like, hello, hello to YouTube, but it just says Facebook user, so I don't know who you are. Good morning to Don Levine from Long Island. Good morning, Dan Schmidt. Good to see you here. Uh, Heidi Felix, good to see you. Then I've got hellos from a bunch of Facebook users. And one of our Facebook users is a level two Reiki practitioner. And even though I'm really in the phone business, hello, I'm assuming that's Larry, the phone guy. <clears throat> All I can see is Facebook user if you haven't connected your Facebook account to StreamYard, but I'm thrilled that everybody's here. You mentioned something earlier that I've done. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert at, but far from it, but I've certainly worked with experts and study this, quantum physics. And, and quantum physics says that everything is energy. Why is that important for us to understand? Because when we recognize that everything is energy, we actually have the power to change it at the level of energy and affect the things that we perceive as physical. Right. So if we were to look at our body, which appears to be the solid, sturdy thing, and it is with, through the perception of the five senses from where we sit. But if we were to look at the body and through an electron microscope and really magnify, 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 we would find that it's mostly space. Atoms are mostly space. And so if energy is the fundamental building block of everything, then wouldn't it behoove us to understand our energetic nature and our energetic structure so that we can impact our life and our physiology from that level? Yeah, that makes sense to me. And the other thing that, that makes sense to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but if everything is energy, that means that we as energetic beings are connected to everything. That's we're, absolutely we're right. The trees and the flowers and the, the, the chair we sit on and, and, uh, what I like, what I believe most people call God is what I call the universal energy. I mean, that, that, that's what I say God is. That's, I don't know that that's right. It's just what I say. But it means we're connected into infinite wisdom and we have access to everything we really need if we just know how to access it. Am I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I agree with that 100%. And that's one reason why remote sessions work. So I've been working with clients on, you know, well, on the phone before Zoom and video conferencing for over a decade. And the reason that I can do so is because, as you said, Jeff, everything is connected. And there is this infinite field. It's called the zero point field in science. And um, we're connected through the zero point field. And so we can tune in if we're trained and I'm trained and you can be trained. Anybody can be trained in this. And some people might have, um, you know, an easier time of it because they already have this proclivity toward sensing things that are beyond the level of the five senses. But anybody can be trained in this. In fact, the U.S. military created this program back in the during the Cold War. So I guess what was that in the 80s? Um, a controlled remote viewing. And that whole, do you know about it? Very cool. Yeah. So, I, I'm a freak for this stuff. In fact, I think I might have shared with you when, when we first spoke that I've worked with a psychic healer. Uh, my coach referred me to a psychic healer to work on some very deep issues. And yeah. all I do is get on the phone with this woman and she's inside me. I can feel her inside me. I mean, it's it's this is very woo woo stuff to some people, but I happen to buy into all of it. And it's really amazing. She's in California and she she has this incredible ability to get me to open up in ways that I don't even to my coach who I trust implicitly. I mean, it, it's really yeah. miraculous stuff. And uh, again, I'm a big believer. I, I love woo woo. And uh, <laughs> my life has definitely shifted uh, from yeah. all this. stuff. Uh, it, it, it's all for the better. Fran Call Hebler down in Texas. Good morning to you. And she says, very interesting. My daughter-in-law is a cert certified Reiki practitioner. I want to switch oh, to cool. something else for a moment because one of the things I do before these interviews is I look at people's LinkedIn posts and there was one that you posted. I, I really was, was uh, I loved and was intrigued by you posted about the difference between Bruce Springsteen and Carly Simon. Do you know which post I'm talking about? Can you totally. share a little bit about that? It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So Bruce Springsteen was, and this is all about mindset, which I love. So Bruce Springsteen, who, if you've ever seen him perform, he's insane. He performs three, four hours. I mean, he is just brings everything he has to his performance. He's phenomenal and he loves it. And he still tours. And he was asked, what is it about touring? Like, how do you feel when you're just about to go out on stage? What is it that you feel like? And he's like, oh my God, it's like incredible. You hear the crowd noise and my heart starts to race and my palms sweat and my stomach is like in knots. And it is, I can't even catch my breath. It's better than an orgasm. It's better than sex. I love it. There's nothing like it. So like, all right, awesome. We can see that when we see you perform, you, you love it. So Carly Simon, who's an artist from the seventies who, you know, um, not everybody might know from your audience, but most people oh, no, would. If you don't know, you, you should not be watching this broadcast if you don't know who Carly Simon is. But <laughs> why you made me feel old, because I certainly know who Carly Simon is. Well, me too, right? So we're the same generation. So Carly Simon stopped performing because she, and she was asked, why did you stop performing? Because she was a really big star back in the 70s and she stopped performing. And she was asked, you know, why did you stop? And she said, oh my God, well, I was about to go out on stage and all of a sudden my heart started to race and I could not catch my breath. My palms started to sweat and I just, I was having a panic attack and I knew I would never be able to perform again. And she didn't, she didn't. And so now if you noticed, both of them had the same physical, physiological response to going out on stage, yet one interpreted those physical sensations as better than sex, and another determined, uh, uh, labeled those physical sensations as a panic attack. And then they both made decisions that impacted the rest of their lives based on the meaning and the interpretation that they made of that experience. And so I say that because we are creating our lives. We can't, you know, we can't decide how our body is going to respond to something in terms of the physical aspect of it and how it feels, but we have 100% influence and direction over how we interpret those sensations. And yeah, Bruce Springsteen and Carly Simon just illustrate that beautifully. Brilliant. Uh, you know, I was, I think, particularly drawn to that post and, and, and what you just talked about, because um, I've had this conversation with 
countless professional speakers. I, I used to be a member of the National Speakers Association and almost to a person, professionals, people who get paid lots and lots of money to go on stage and share information, almost to a person they've told me, oh, before, I, when I'm waiting in the wings, my heart is beating and I'm terrified and I, I, I'm scared and I don't know what I'm going to do. And for me, it's it's completely the opposite. It's I always describe it like this. When I'm in the wings waiting to be introduced, I'm like a racehorse at the gate, just pawing. And I can't wait for, I live for the moment when somebody says, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Goldberg. Uh, I was in Atlanta two weeks ago, I think it was, about two weeks ago to deliver a motivational speech. And I'm sitting at a table, just waiting for the gentleman to introduce me. And he's kind of giving a talk. And I'm like, okay, come on, let's get to the good part. I hear him <laughs> about to introduce, he starts reading my introduction. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. And I went running up to the stage. I kind of jumped onto the stage. He goes, you seem excited. I said, I can't wait to share what I've got with you. But oh, it, I love it. It. now that I, I, I've always described that as I'm wired up weird, because that's not a conscious thing for me. It's just, that's how my body reacts. I love doing what I do and I can't wait to share it. And I don't feel that fear. Um, but but let, let's talk about mindset. You do have a very different perspective on mindset than most. How do you see mindset? Well, I see the mind is not independent from body. So mind, body, energy are one system. And we're oftentimes just focused on one aspect when we're talking about mindset. People are thinking about thoughts and beliefs and attitudes, and that's absolutely a part of it. But as I said earlier, 90 to 98% of our thoughts are subconscious. So if we're only able to, to work with two to 10% of what is really our overall mindset, then how much, you know, how much change are we really going to be able to make? I mean, it'll be incremental at best. So we need to use a broader, um, a broader definition of mindset. And if we look at mind, body, energy, well, now we've got the full picture because ultimately everything is energy. And if you think of thoughts, what is a thought? Well, it's a packet of mental energy. A thought is not tangible. I can't open up your head and see all the thoughts that you're having in your head. It, they don't exist in physical form. So we want to look at mindset as what, what one is going on in our body when we're having certain thoughts or certain experiences. So we want to become aware of what's going on in our body and thus in our energy. And then we can use and use like biohacking, if you will, with different energy points on our body to then affect our mindset and our psychology. So it's like our psychology affects our biology right? Mind affects body. And the reverse is also true because it's a system. Body also affects mind. And they did a study. I don't remember what university, but they did a study on people who were depressed and people who were chronically clinically depressed for a really long period of time. And they did a study with them and had them simply smile for like 20 minutes. And I don't know if they remember if they had to look in the mirror or just, I don't think they did. I think that you just said they simply smiled. And over the course of the study, these depressed people, the depression lifted just by doing that. Now, these are people who had been treated inpatient. They'd been treated with medications. They'd been treated with all the conventional means. Nothing helped, but just simply by creating the physical um, a construct of the smile on their on their face it started to change because what's happening your biochemistry is changing when you smile your body is creating totally different biochemicals and a cascade of hormones that is different from when you're frowning completely different so that alone so shows us how powerful the impact of the body is on the mind so what can we do with the body to shift our mindset well actually a lot <laughs> So I want to show you guys some things that you can do with your body um, to impact your mindset, especially if you're feeling scared. I mean, Jeff, you probably don't need this because you love speaking, but a lot of people don't, right? A lot of people are terrified of it. And I was in Toastmasters. I was terrified of it, you know? And, and even now when I speak, I have some anxiety, but, you know, we can, we can call it whatever we want. I always tell my clients, if you're feeling fear, you know, fear and excitement are very close to one another vibrationally in terms of their frequency. So, you know, and Gay Hendricks, who's a terrific coach and an author and a, 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 a leadership expert, he calls fear as excitement with, or he calls fear excitement without the breath. So if we just remember to breathe, Right. The sensations of excitement and fear are very similar, just like Carly and Bruce demonstrated to us. 
right? So it's the interpretation. So I always tell clients, if instead of feeling fear, or if you're feeling fear, just say it's 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 not because it's scary, it's because it's unfamiliar. Because the subconscious mind has two responsibilities, one, to keep us safe, and two, to keep us alive, which is really just one, right? We have to be safe in order to be alive. But that's it, that's it, that's its responsibility. And so when we are entering an unfamiliar situation or we're entering a situation where we could potentially, you know, make a mistake, be embarrassed. The subconscious mind deems that as um, unsafe. And so then it starts to generate the chemistry of fight, flight, freeze. That's what it does. And so then we feel scared and we feel anxious. Well, what if we just started to breathe? What if one week we became aware of it, took a breath, said, okay, this is unfamiliar. And like you, maybe even got excited about it. Because I always tell clients, when you're starting to feel that that anxiety or anxiousness or fear, that's because you're at the edge of your comfort zone. You're about to break through into a whole new level. So you can start feeling excited about that. Like, oh, yeah, because I really want the thing that's on the other side of this. I really want that thing. So, all right, maybe I can start creating a different meaning, a different story around the physiology. Uh, that, that actually makes a, a ton of sense because... Uh, it's all really based on the story that we make up for for ourselves. You know, we're li- we're we're mostly, I think, living the story that we decided on by the time we're eight or nine years old, and we're stuck in that for the most part. Uh, and I also love the piece about smiling. Um, it, doesn't the act of smiling release, like just like exercise and the oxytocin, d- d- dopamine, the, the feel good chemicals? Yes. Yep. So so uh, you. Know, the people who've been watching uh, a lot of these broadcasts have heard me say this before, but I start my day by walking my, well, of course I go to the bathroom, but then I walk my dog. And while I'm walking my dog, first of all, it's in the dark usually, uh, uh, and I have a headlight on my my uh, my head because I'm looking around for bad things for him to eat. But while I'm doing this, I have a smile on my face. I, I walk around like this, and I know I look like an idiot, and I'm talking out loud to myself, setting up my day. Today's going to be a great day. Only incredibly wonderful things are going to happen to myself and my family today. I have a whole litany that goes on for like 10 minutes, but I'm walking through my neighborhood with a smile on my face, and uh, I'm not I'm not superhuman, but I tend to have really good days almost all the time. I rarely, I'm, I'm not one of those people who walks around, oh, woe is me, my day sucks. Do I have challenges in my life? Yeah, just like everyone, but I believe in what you're saying, the power of mindset. It, it, you choose. You choose to be happy. You choose to be sad. You choose to be miserable. You choose to be excited. And when you, I believe, when you accept responsibility for that and realize you are ultimately responsible for the way you feel, it gives you great power. It's also a huge responsibility because that means if your life sucks, guess who's responsible for that? But the flip side of that is, wow, if I'm responsible, I get to choose. I choose to be successful. I choose to be healthy. I choose to be supportive. All the all the positive things that most people want in their lives. A- am I right? Totally, a thousand percent. And um, I, you know, I love that you do that. So you're it's, smiling like that. It's a biohack. That's what you're doing, whether you were conscious or not, of it or not. You're just like, all right, I'm gonna just walk you know, walk my dog and, and be happy and then say all these positive affirmations. And affirmations work. To some degree, you know, I have I have to say I have a love hate relationship with affirmations because a lot of times people will think, all right, we'll just slap an affirmation on that, you know, just slap it. But but what you're doing is not simply affirming. You are engaging the body as well as the the mind in that practice, right? And so that's why it goes deeper and it works as powerfully and effectively as it does because you're including the body in it, whether again conscious or not. You're you're using more of that formula of mind, body, energy, and you're including your energy too, because everything we do includes our energy. So you're using the full system rather than just, you feel terrible and you're sitting in your chair and you're like, okay, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be successful. It's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And, you know, I travel in some spiritual circles and a lot of times in those circles, it's like, Oh, use positive affirmations, use positive affirmations. I'm like, yeah, you're using the affirmation, but everything else that you're doing in terms of your behavior and your action and what you're doing with your body is incongruent 
with that statement. And so the statement's really not going to have a lot of power. But the way you're using it, Jeff, it has a ton of power because you're active, you're in motion, you're also putting the smile on your face, you're using your body, and you're, you know, you're engaging a lot of different dimensions of that mind body energy formula. So it's really yeah. successful for you. Yeah, for me, it's not just about a positive attitude, although I, I believe that a positive attitude beats a negative attitude all day long. But, you know, uh, all, all, the, all the law of attraction stuff, uh, uh, you know, they, they, and the positive attitude people, they, they left something out. You know, I, I was a big uh, proponent of the law of attraction when it first came, became popular, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Oprah was all over it. And there was a book yeah. and a movie called The Secret and a bunch of others. And, you know, I, I do believe you have to feel the right feelings and think the right thoughts. But what they left out was you also have to take action. Uh, and and the, the reason that I walk around with a smile on my face saying these positive things in the morning is because in my experience, the way most people wake up is, oh, shit, another day I got to go to work again. I hate my life if I only had this. And my choice is to speak to myself in a way that's setting it up to be positive, because I do believe that what you speak becomes true. Couldn't agree more. <clears throat> Good morning to Ken Glenn, who says... Uh, let's let's show this. Really good stuff, guys. Ken is listening from New Zealand. Wow, all the way in New Zealand. Ken, oh, by the way, my daughter Skylar wants my daughter Skylar wants me to bring her to New Zealand. I think we're going to make it there one day because we're both Lord of the Rings freaks and we want to see where all that stuff was filmed. Um, <laughs> so, so how does the healing energy energy work that you do apply to mindset? Well. As I said earlier, we have different points on our body that connect to different energy systems, energy channels, and those energy channels affect the nervous system. So when we go into negative thinking, when we start feeling anxious or stressed out or, you know, um, fearful, then as we talked earlier, our body starts creating a certain biochemistry and we can and, and what happens, let's just talk about the fight flight response for a second from a nervous system level. So what happens when we go into fight or flight? And now our fight flight response is millions of years old. And it was the same when we were living in primitive societies, tribal societies, and we were living in a predator rich environment. We're truly any, on any given day, we could be eaten. We could be killed, right? So our nervous system is anchored in that still. We don't live in those societies anymore. We're not living amongst predators like wild animals. Okay, no, I mean, in New York and Chicago, maybe we are, but you know, wild animals. We're not living in danger of like, a you know, a saber tooth tiger eating us for lunch. But our nervous system will respond in the same way to a bad you know, a bad review, bad performance review, a bad call with a client, um, a bill that we kind of can't pay or an altercation with our spouse, our nervous system is going to respond in the same exact way as we're going to be eaten by a saber toothed tiger. And what happens is our forebrain, which is the most evolved part of the human brain that is unique to human beings only, to the, the species only, that's where all of our logic, reason, language, all of those faculties are in the forebrain. 80, up to 80 to 85% of the blood leaves the forebrain when we go into fight, flight, freeze, and goes to the large muscle groups, arms, legs, to either run to safety or to beat something up and to fight. So to fight or flee. So all of the resources that we actually need for the kinds of problems and you know, issues that we face in modern living, all of those resources have gone to the large muscle groups. We need to get them back here. We need to get them back into the forebrain. And I say, we got to get back online so that we can problem solve, so we can troubleshoot, so that we can also articulate. Have you ever had a situation where you've been really, really angry about something and you just can't find your words? You just can't yeah. find your words, right? Well, that's because all of the resources have gone where they're not needed, right? Because your nervous system is millions of years old. So, and then later when you're more relaxed, you're like, oh, I should have said this. I should have said that. I could have said this, right? Like we come up with our whole argument later because, but then our brain is back online. So here's what you can do when you go off in any kind of fight, flight, freeze. So it can be any situation that you feel triggered and you just, you know, need to get back online. 
you're going to, so we have these points on the front of our head called neurovascular, re, neurovascular reflex points. They are on the frontal eminences right here of our forehead. Now, they'll be more pronounced on some people. They're on everybody. So you're just going to take your hands. Our hands are electromagnetic. Our whole body is electromagnetic. And you're going to, you can either do it this way, simple, simple. Put your hand on your forehead here, touching those points with light pressure. Put the hand on the back of the head, opposite the front. And that is creating a circuit. And you're going to just breathe. And I like to just breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. And again, your breath, as you slow down your breath with intention, when you're stressed out, that change of this, the breath sends the signal to your nervous system. Hey, wait a minute, I'm calm. Because when you go into fight flight, your breath becomes shallow. So that's an aspect of the fight flight response. If you're starting to deliberately slow down your breath, you're sending the, the, the message to your nervous system, it's okay. You don't, you're not in danger, everything can go back online. When you're holding these points, what'll happen is you're gonna feel pulses on your forehead underneath the palm of your hand. And that means that the blood has returned to the forebrain and you're officially off of the fight flight response in your nervous system. The switch has been flipped off. So it's really simple. You have to remember to do it. And when you're triggered, you're not gonna remember. So put up a sticky note. I have sticky notes everywhere because I too have a very primitive cave woman brain. And so when I get angry or upset, I forget. So to have the reminder, you know, this I call safe mode because you're really sending the signal through your physiology, through your biology, through your body to the mind and nervous system, you're safe. You don't need to freak out. So that's right. option A. Option B, same points. You're going to make the, oh, this I call I'm okay. You make the okay sign with your hands and then you just pinkies on the inner corner of your eyebrow and everything else falls where it needs to. And you can hold this posture for the same result. You can hold this posture for a variety of different things, but this is, you can hold, hold this posture and get the same result. The, the key is that you're using the electromagnetics of your hand to return blood to your forebrain. And the other reason why it happens is because we have iron in our blood. So it's magnetized, it's drawn back to where we really need it. Mm, fascinating stuff. This, I think this is starting to explain maybe why my ex-wife used to despise arguing with me. Because when you said, do I, am I ever so angry that I don't have the words? The truth is that rarely happens because when I get into an argument, I tend to get calm. I don't start screaming and hollering and get crazy. Mm -hmm. That was kind of her. And that's, that's, let's go back to psychology. My father was that way. My, my real father, as opposed to my stepfather's, uh, my father was that way. He actually spent time in mental institutions. I think he was bipolar and he would go crazy. I mean, I saw him do very crazy things. And I believe that a, a young age, I made a conscious decision. That's not going to be me. So when I start feeling myself get that, uh, I tend to go, oh. It's not even conscious for me, but I, I, I get calmer. And uh, somebody who's out of their mind crazy finds a hard time arguing with somebody who's being calm and logical. So uh, uh, maybe I needed to be crazy or she needed to be calmer and we'd still be married. But yeah, that, that, that kind of explains <laughs> me. Now, now we're, we're talking about stuff that, you know, I mentioned woo-woo before and we're talking about woo-woo stuff. Um, what if somebody doesn't believe in woo-woo? Does this stuff all still apply? Yeah, because it's all, everything is connected. I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't believe that this is going to work. If you do it, it's going to work because it's, you're, it's, it's, you're activating a trigger. You're activating something that's already built into all of us. So you don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe any of it. And I have, and I am health, I'm still a very healthy skeptic, despite the fact that I've been doing this now for 12 years, which I can't believe. I've been doing this for 12 year, 12 years. I've seen people including myself, have results that are amazing and fly in the face of conventional, you know, practices and techniques. And I still sometimes I'm like, is this real? But it is. But it is. And we become just so addicted to the things that we can only perceive with our five senses. We are so addicted to that, that we are missing out on so much more. We are missing out on so much more. You know, things like telepathy, things like even by location. I mean, those are things that are really woo woo, but every, all of that is, is real. And it's something that can be um, learned. 
by all of us. We all have that potentiality. I don't know. Have you ever written a read autobiography of a yogi? I have. Well, so you know. So back then, right, Yogananda was talking about these gurus in India who were bilocating, who were, and they were seen by people in two different places at the same exact time. So this is, this, these are technologies that we actually have built into us, but we just haven't yet learned to utilize, you know? And so you don't have to believe it because the proof is in the pudding, really. <laughs> it much, still much works. Like gravity. I know you've used that example, much like gravity. You don't have to believe it, but if I open my fingers, the pen's dropping, whether I believe it or not. And, and you, you once again brought to mind, because I, I have heard about the, the things that the U.S. Army was doing years ago with bi, uh, bilocation, remote viewing. I mean, it's really incredible yeah. stuff. Good morning, Keith Ginsburg. Good to see that you've joined us. Um, there was another post that I saw that was fascinating. How do we optimize our brain function? You were talking about the two, the, the left and the right brain and how to optimize that. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So most of us are very left brain dominant, right? We're all about reason and logic and thinking and all that. And right brain is all about creativity. It's all about out of the box thinking. And that's really helpful when we're in communication with people, right? Because we don't want to be rigid and fixed in our perspective and our viewpoint. We want to be able to entertain and be open to other points of view and other perspective and other ideas. So we want to create, um, co we want to create a communication between the left and right hemispheres. And there's a structure in our brain called the corpus callosum that joins the left and right hemisphere of our brain. And it can really get clogged up. And if we're left brain dominant, as most of us are, because we've been conditioned to be, the way that we live in the Western world, we've been conditioned to be right brain dominant, focus on linear, getting from A to B to C to D. So most of us are left brain dominant. And even if you're right brain dominant, you really want to be balanced, right? We might all know some people, especially, like I said, the spiritual circles, we have people who are just, you know, all airy fairy and all that. And they really just don't have any basis in like reality sometimes. And they're just not really grounded. We want to have um, a balance between the left and right hemispheres. And so one way that we can do that is through this exercise. And you just take your fingers and you start right here in the middle of your, uh, your third eye. And then you weave a figure eight. And what you're doing, again, this is electromagnetic, and you just use a really light touch, and you weave a figure eight. And as you do this, this is enhancing communication between the two hemispheres of the brain, and you're optimizing your brain function so that you're using then your left and right hemispheres. So you, you can be logic, you can be logical and reasonable, but you can also have access to those creative faculties, those ways of looking at things from a different point of view and a different perspective. This is also really good to do. So let me just finish showing you the exercise. You're going to go, I don't know, five, six, seven passes one way, and you want to do it kind of slowly, and then you're just going to reverse, okay? Which, these crossover patterns are all over our body, all the way from the right hemisphere of our brain regulating the left side of our body and the left hemisphere regulating the right, all the way down to the double helix of our DNA. These crossover patterns are very much a part of our biology and our energy body. So whenever we do anything that crosses things across the midline of our body, it's very, very good for us. So with this exercise, you're going to go one way, you're going to go reverse, and then you're going to do it with the other hand, one way, and then reverse. Okay. This is really great to do. Um, this will help children and pets even to calm down. It's very soothing and calming. This will help to, again, um, create that great communication between left and right hemispheres of our brain. It's good to do before you're going to get into a conversation with somebody. If you want to have a especially a difficult conversation with someone, you really want to approach it from a very balanced place. So this is good to do before that. It's good to do before a phone call, a presentation. I do this exercise before I get on talks, podcasts, before I do videos. Um, it's just, it's, and it's really easy, right? So this is another biohack. Sounds like for students, it'd be a great thing to do before a test. Yes, absolutely. Got it. Um, why do you think people fear letting their authentic self be shown to the world? Uh, the biggest fear would be that they're going to be rejected. And there's research done on rejection and the nervous system responds to rejection as though we have been physically struck. 
as though somebody has literally hit us. That's the impact that being rejected has on our nervous system. And so it, so our subconscious does everything possible to keep us from the risk of being rejected. Mm. Fascinating. So, um, how does one go about, about, and I know you work with a lot of women on, on this, but how do we create our world on our own terms in order to be the best version of ourselves? How do we actually do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is what does that even look like? I think most people are really adept at answering the question, what don't you want versus what do you want? And even when I ask mm -hmm. clients like, well, what is it that you want? It's like, well, I don't want this to happen and I don't want to have to do this and I don't want to, and I said, yeah, I'm hearing what you don't want, but what do you want? And the, so the first thing to being able to live life on our terms is to know what does that even look like, right? Because we need to have a target. We need to be able to put a destination into the GPS of our brain to get us from where we are to where we're going. So that would be the first thing. And then we need to do some you know, introspection. We need to really look at like, well, what's keeping me from this? All right, now that I know what I want, what is it that's keeping me from this? Because that's going to start illuminating your beliefs. And the beliefs are where the action is. Our beliefs, and many of them are hidden, and many of them are limiting. They need to be exposed to the light of day so that we can start to do something about them. And as you stated earlier, Jeff, you know, most of our beliefs are established before the you know, age seven or eight. They're established in early childhood. And those beliefs are very, you know, they're age appropriate for, you know, we created those associations and those representations of things in life at those early ages based on the worldview of a child. And they were appropriate. And from a subconscious mind perspective, they were necessary for our survival. And if we grew up in, you know, other than in a loving environment, and even in a loving environment, we still have things that go wrong. Um, we're using that belief system then as we become adults, and we're using those beliefs as the filters through which we look at the world. And so we need to start exploring what are our beliefs? We need to start doing some reflective work. And not everybody feels comfortable doing that because it can expose some painful things. But we need to have that um, courage to really look within, look at what's going on, and then start to take action to shift it and transform it. And that's where this work really helps because it lets us get below the surface of just the conscious awareness, lets us tap into like the operating system, if you will, of our subconscious mind to start transforming those beliefs. Because when those beliefs happened, they made sense, they don't apply now, but we're still running our lives based on those limiting beliefs. So that would be the next thing is you look at the beliefs and then you start creating the actions. What does it take for me to embody this reality um, that I really wanna create? And that also means changing your identity, our self-concept, the way that we see ourselves has to change. People often want everything, you know, they want all these different things in their world, but they don't want to do what they need to do in order to create that change, right? There are so many people like, I want a certain body, but well, I'm just, uh, I'm not going to go to the gym today. <laughs> it happens all the time. Well, you have to see yourself as a person who does not make excuses about exercise if you want to have that, you know, six pack. Right? You have to become a different person and we have to shed those old you know, identities. And so we need to do some work around that too, is creating an identity. Who is the person that would embody this kind of a life? Who is she? Who is he? What would that look like? You want to be a six-figure earner, seven-figure earner. What, is, what are the habits that six and seven-figure earners have? And how do they match up to the habits that you have? They're probably going to be pretty different. And so then we need to start taking action as well. So we create the foundation by doing the belief work. How would, how would I need to believe? What do I need to heal? We need to do healing work. And that's something that's left out of a lot of coaching is we have to heal stuff. We can't just, I always say, put frosting on poop and just transform everything, <laughs> right? And just transform everything without healing some stuff. So we need to identify what are the wounds? What do we need to heal? Where do we want to go? What do we need to believe? What's standing in the way of it? And then how do I be that now? How do we be that person? 
Yeah. I, I, you know, it so rings true, the part that you were talking about, all of it does, but uh, that people often are stuck in, here's what I don't want, as opposed to what I do want. And, you know, when I work with coaching clients, it, it's, you know, who do you want to be? And are you willing to pay the price? Most people, I, I call it the difference between working in your business and working on your business. Most people are so busy all day long, trying to make money, working in their business, which we have to do, but they don't take the time to work on their business, or in this case, on themselves. And that's an investment that usually pays off in spades, but we just don't, we don't take the time because we're so busy trying to keep up. And, and it takes that slowing down and really doing the work. There, there's nothing that replaces doing the work. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time and we're quickly running out. Oh, Ron Tomo, good to see you, my friend. Haven't spoken to you in years and years. Um, glad that you're joining us today. Um, by the way, if you uh, are watching us live, there's still time to say hello. And if you watch on the replay, please put replay in the uh, in the comments. Um, God, I've got 75 more questions that I wanted to ask you, and we've only got about nine minutes. Um, oh, let's get to this because this will be perfect for, for the viewers. Um, often salespeople do a fantastic job all the way through the sales process. They, they establish rapport. They ask the right questions. They give a great presentation. And then when it comes time to talk about money, they blow it completely. And uh, I'll just share this briefly, then I'm going to ask your opinion on this and how, what we can do. But I, I about, about two or three months ago, there were two guys in Australia who were pitching me on something that I was very interested in. I reached out to them about their service because I, I, I was really interested. And these, well, as a sales coach, when anybody's talking to me and trying to sell me something, I'm, I'm really in two places at the same time. One is I'm listening intently to what they're offering me because I want to evaluate, is this good for me or not? But the other side is, how are they doing it as a salesperson? I'm constantly you know, picking that apart. And at, at the end of the conversation, the, the guy who was leading the, it really just fell apart when it came time to talk about money. I, I, could, I know he was nervous about it. I know he didn't feel confident in his pricing. And I actually asked him after he gave it to me, would you mind if I offer you some free coaching? And he said, yeah, sure. I said, you did great up until now, but you blew it. You clearly think you're charging too much for your product, don't you? And he goes, yeah, it's kind of expensive. I said, dude, you had me. You had me, but you lost me. If you don't believe it, then how am I supposed to believe it? So why is it that salespeople get nervous to talk about price? And is, is there anything that they can do about that? Yeah, well, because we we start projecting our own money stuff onto the, the money conversation. So all of those limiting beliefs start to come up. And we also think, and I've done this in the past, and I remember I, I, I used to have a graphic design business with Amy, the woman who introduced the two of us. And we worked with a florist who, they were like one of the top florists in Chicago and, you know, charging five, six, seven hundred dollars for a centerpiece for a wedding. And I were and and they were also they were a lovely couple. And the woman said to me, and I never forgot this, she and she was somebody who was not very extravagant with her expending. And so I thought, well, how is it that you're charging this kind of money for this flower arrangement? And she said, Shweta, you have to take yourself out of it. Just because it's not something that you would pay for doesn't mean that other people won't. And so you have to take what your willingness is to pay something out of the equation. And she said, some clients wouldn't want to pay less. So you just have to take yourself out of it. So one, stop putting yourself in that situation. You might not be the ideal client for what it is that you're selling anyway. You might not have the need that um, this other person, the, your prospect has. So you might not be willing to spend the money. So one, take yourself out of the situation. You're projecting your own money stuff onto it. Two, what happens is people start to, the focus becomes on them when the money conversation comes, To right? It's like the focus is on the client, the prospect, the, the conversation. And then all of a sudden when the money aspect of it happens, they start becoming self-conscious about themselves. How do I sound? Am I asking too much? Are they going to judge me? Because we're afraid that we're being judged. We become afraid of being judged. So a couple things that you can do. One, do this exercise before you get into that conversation. Two, this is a great one, um, is there's a point on the back of our hand. It's called the gamut point. It's right here between the fourth and fifth fingers, just right down where those two bones come together. The great thing about this point is that, and you can massage it. Sometimes you feel pain there. Oftentimes mine is kind of tender and it's bilateral. So it doesn't matter which hand. The cool thing about this is this communicates directly with the fight, flight, freeze response. And so if you're in a meeting and you're about to get to that money conversation, you can start just with your hands in your lap. You can start to massage this point and that's going to keep you calmer. 
So it's a little biohack that you can do that's very easy. I call it stealth mode because nobody knows you're even doing it. We could be talking and I've just got my hand here and you don't, it doesn't, you don't know anything and we're chatting. So that's going to calm your nervous system down when you're in the presence of somebody else and you can't do this, right? But what I'm going to also say is do this or do this as you're imagining having that money conversation. Because the thing about these po points is that they are wonderful when we've been triggered in a reactive situation, but they're also great proactively. So if you visualize, and I imagine a lot of your salespeople use visualization as a tool, as a tool because it's, it's, that's a really great way for us to, you know, make progress and see ourselves being successful. When you're visualizing conversations with people, you hold these points because what's happening is the anxiety that you feel with the money conversation is getting triggered as you imagine having it. But then you're kind of sending a mixed message to your body saying, wait a minute, you're getting scared, but you shouldn't, you don't need to get scared because you're holding these points. So what happens over time is that anxiety starts to decrease around that trigger because now we've started disassociating it from the anxiety and the fight flight response by holding these points. So you're using it proactively in advance of the situation that triggers you and you're actually becoming more resilient. Love it. Love it. Yeah. I, I've had this conversation with people a million times and I said the exact same thing, not, not about the, my, the body work, but uh, take yourself out of it. Don't worry. I always advise salespeople, do not worry what's in the other person's pocket. They'll worry about that. That's for them to decide, but don't worry about it. Uh, Siemens Corporation, you know, multinational corporation. I, I did a lot of business with, with them up in Canada for a while. They called me in to consult with them because they were having an issue. It was the division that manufactures hearing aids. And the, they, they called me and they said, Jeff, we manufacture three different levels of hearing aids that get sold through clinics, which are just retail stores. And these retail stores are uh, staffed by audiologists. People, you come in, you take a hearing test, they make a recommendation. Jeff, we make three levels of hearing aids, the least expensive, a moderately priced one, and then an expensive one. And of course, the more expensive one has more features and better for you and all that stuff. But here's the problem, Jeff. They, the audiologists recommend the least expensive pair every single time, and we don't know why. We want them to sell more of the medium and the high level. So I interviewed a bunch of these audiologists. Here's what I found out. They did not make a lot of money and they could not afford to buy the medium or the high priced pair. And they were putting their own financial situation onto the prospect. So, you know, we're ruled by what's going on in our mind. We're, we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to get to one other thing very quickly because I'm fascinated by this stuff. You attended a Tony Robbins event about a year ago. Uh, what would you get out of that? I, I love Tony. He's, he's, he's just the boss. Oh, totally, totally. He's amazing. I, that was such a phenomenal experience for me. And, you know, we chopped, we broke wood with our hands and all this stuff. And it was, it was virtual. And so that was even, you know, something to really be able to get into that, like embodiment of all of that energy and his, he's just incredible. Um, if anybody, you know, it, it, years ago, I mean, I thought, oh, this guy's so cheesy, you know, when he was doing infomercials and stuff, he's just so cheesy and weird. He's phenomenal. And I'm telling you, this guy knows energy. He has studied with some really huge, huge hitters. And he doesn't talk about it the way that we are about energy and stuff. He frames it in a different way. But when he's talking about state, he's talking about energy. He's talking about your nervous system, you know, so he's talking about all this stuff in a really approachable way. I think he's great. Yeah, he's completely awesome. And if, if anybody knows who we're talking about, you'd like to see something very cool on Netflix. There's a special about him called I'm Not Your Guru. It's brilliant because you get to see the behind the scenes of Tony. I, I Look, I'm pretty, a pretty energetic guy. I don't know how he does it. The guy, the guy explodes onto a stage and there is never a time when he's flagging. It, it's just incredible. Yeah. Shweta, we're, we're out of time. I'm going to share my screen. Could you uh, please tell people how can they reach you if they're interested in uh, working with you or just having a chat with you? Oh, yes, of course. Well, um, the easiest way is to email me or to call me. I've got my business number and you can call or text that number. You can email me. You can also go to my website, which is shwedishmani.com. Really easy. Um, you can go there. You can book a 30-minute discovery session and we can chat about whatever is going on for you. I'm also on LinkedIn. I have a Facebook business page that's personal point of power that was the name of my practice personal point of power holistic therapies and um i've since changed to my name but i haven't updated the facebook business page so it's still under that name and um yeah 
you've got my email and phone. So I would love to hear from you. I would love your feedback. I would love your thoughts. And if there's anything I can do to help, please do reach out. It's fantastic. Shweta, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your brilliance so generously. I love this stuff and can talk to you all day long, every day. Uh, <laughs> To the Sales Pro Network, I apologize if there was a little confusion, not just at the beginning of this broadcast because of technical stuff. Uh, my business has exploded in the last six months, and I am busier than I've ever been, and a couple of things have slipped through the cracks. I know today was supposed to be Ask the Sales Coach, and then I said, now that's going to be next week. Actually, we have a great panel discussion next week with um, Mitch Tobel, Rich Atkins, and Beth Granger. We're going to be talking about how not to market yourself in 2022. And of course, from there, we'll get to how to market yourself. So bear with me. I'm trying to get everything straightened while I'm doing my business and taking care of uh, you guys and me and my kids and all that stuff. Uh, if you're on the East Coast in the uh, path of the storm, I hope everybody stays safe. And uh, I'm hoping that, like so many times, the weather people are wrong and that I don't have to bring out the snowblower later. And I will end as I always do. Please remember sales is a game of making things happen. So get out there and make sales happen. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.